Hello, everyone, and welcome so much to our CAP webinar today. We are very uh, fortunate to have Dr. Stephen Hinshaw sharing with us today about applying a developmental lens to pediatric mental health. Dr. Hinshaw is a clinical psychologist and professor of psychology at UC Berkeley, and he's also the vice chair for child and adolescent psychology and a professor in residence in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences here at UCSF. In addition, he serves as the co-director of the Child, Teen, and Family Center at UCSF and is co-director of the Schwab's Dyslexia and Cognitive Diversity Center, which is a joint initiative between UCSF and UC Berkeley. Thanks so much, Dr. Hinshaw, for giving us our talk today. And I'll go ahead and turn this over to you. Very good. So uh, hi, everybody. And we've got a lot of ground to cover, so I'll get started. And uh, no disclosures. There's the disclosure slide. And so we're going to talk for the first little bit about this field, this construct, this guiding uh, light in our field of developmental psychopathology, what some core principles are, uh, but most importantly, how to apply these principles into the real world of practice. I'll spend a few minutes then on ADHD, an area I've done a lot of work in, as an exemplar of how some of these principles come to life. And it'll be a bit of a where's Waldo, where you'll see in some of the material I present some of these concepts coming in. And again, the goal is just to make this not so much chalk talk, but applicable. And I will have a little time at the end for question and answer. So developmental psychopathology got its start almost 50 years ago when an epidemiologist in Vermont named Tom Achenbach, that many of you know through the Achenbach Child Behavior Checklist and Teacher Report Forms and the ACEBA, wrote a book called Developmental Psychopathology. And uh, it wasn't a bestseller. I think both people who read it really enjoyed it, but it set the stage for the field because he said, we're just not getting far enough in child clinical psychology, adolescent psychology, child adolescent psychiatry, and straightforward developmental psychology, which focused too much really on basic norms, but not much about individual differences or kids needing clinical attention. So this book set the stage for a special issue of child development in 1983, and then Dante Cicchetti launched the journal Development and Psychopathology in 1989. It's now in volume 32, going on 33, and it's kind of taken over like wildfire. So let's go through a few principles, and Joan, I think you're going to have to advance. So number one, Achenbach and Cicchetti and Mike Rudder and everybody has said over the years, how can you know about psychopathology unless you know a whole lot about normative development? So how would we know what ADHD is unless we know from infancy to toddlerhood and preschool and on how attention develops? Or as we'll talk about in a few minutes, maybe it's not really an attention disorder, but it's a self-regulation disorder or self-control disorder. How would we know anything really about the fundamental mechanisms of autism spectrum disorders unless we knew how kids typically at very young ages, not even three and four to develop theory of mind, but with nonverbal tests between one and two, start to understand that others have different perspectives than they do. Same thing about uh, depression in kids and adolescents, uh, cognitive processes like rumination, emotion regulation, you get the picture. We need to know a lot about normative development to understand psychopathology. And with this perspective, I mean, I learned in grad school a long time ago that bipolar disorder you had or you didn't, autism you had or you didn't, and everybody knows now everything is on a spectrum. There's very few absolute essentialist categories. That doesn't mean that we can't make a diagnosis or that some kids are much more impaired than others, but let's go to the next slide. The flip side is but wait a minute, if we really learned about psychopathology, wouldn't we learn a lot more about normative development? And this is a long tradition in neurology, famous single case studies, Phineas Gage and the tamping iron, HM, bilateral uh, removal of the hippocampus, really set the stage for understanding how important the hippocampus is for the translation of short-term into long-term memory. PKU, uh, a single recessive gene, a double allele, is a model in some ways for how executive functions and intelligence develop. But most forms of psychopathology aren't a single accident or a single surgery or a single gene. They're much more complex. So in some ways, we'll try to discover a little bit today, and I hope you'll be thinking about how could 
the clinical work and the research we all do in psychopathology inform theories of normative development. So let's go to the next. So I'm gonna go very quickly through these text heavy slides. How do most kids without ever being taught form theory of mind between three and four, but kids even with high functioning autism seem not to, although they can figure it out analytically uh, when, when they're a bit older. Uh, models of ADHD from Europe on reward sensitivity have really informed uh, motivational theories of normative child development. Uh, the infamous Eastern European Romanian adoption studies have taught us a lot about critical or at least sensitive periods about attachment and about bonding with implications for inattention, overactivity, uh, attachment later in life, interpersonal relationships, et cetera. So let's go to the next. So the next big principle is, and everybody's seen diagrams of this, multiple levels of analysis. We're made of quarks and protons and neutrons and electrons, and those form elements and molecules and genes from our DNA and the products of genes. I'm not going to read up the whole ladder here. Most of us are somewhere in the middle of behaviors, behavioral change, social relationships, clinical entities, delving into schools and neighborhoods. But as we'll talk just all too little about later in the talk, things like policy make a big difference in terms of, for example, with ADHD, the huge variation in rates of ADHD diagnosis across the United States are a pretty direct function of whether the states have in place policies that prioritize school achievement above all else. We have three times more diagnosis in Arkansas uh, and in um, North Carolina and Indiana than we do in California and Nevada, largely because uh, we think uh, of school policies. So it's the interrelations across these levels that lead to the next slide. Transactional models. Do parents respond to kids' temperament or do parents help shape temperament? Well, yes, see both of the above. Reciprocal processes repeated over time become transactions. And the transactions aren't just between a parent and a child and a teacher and a child or a clinician and a child. They span the multiple levels of analysis. Obviously, epigenetics is the study of how, quote, outside forces get inside the skin and don't change or alter the DNA, but change its expression. So transactional models are everywhere. We tend to focus in the clinical world on one-to-one -one or family or school, but these wider transactions across culture, uh, even nation are just as important. Let's go to the next slide. This is basically what I've just said, how uh, development of early onset antisocial behavior leading to delinquency. It's a series of processes whereby fairly small individual differences in temperament at early ages get magnified by coercive parent-child interactions, the kids labeled, special education processes, et cetera, et cetera. So moving quickly, let's go to the next slide. So number four principle are these fancy terms, equifinality and multifinality. I should alter this slide because it's not just blurry, but let's say risk factor A, B, and C. Here's our outcome. A kid with ADHD, we'll transfer to that topic in a few minutes. In some cases, mom has undiagnosed but pretty notable problems in executive function. Dad had an ADHD diagnosis. Grandparents have back in the days when it's called hyperkinesis or hyperactivity. In another case, there's no family history, but the child was born at very or extremely low birth weight. And in the third case, there doesn't seem to be a, a genetic history, but the child was reared in a deprivation-laden orphanage where not only absence of key attachment bonds, but inattention and overactivity are the key symptoms. The kid might have, in these three cases, very similar DSM checklist symptoms, but obviously three very different pathways. Multiple roads lead to Rome is the uh, translation of what equifinality is. And in multifinality, and these terms come from embryology and systems theory, developmental psychopathology has sort of uh, co-opted them. 
a simple single risk factor uh, inhibited temperament, very uh, low effortful control at age 12 months may lead to a clinically significant outcome, may in other cases, in a very enriched environment, lead to better than expected outcome. And in other cases, it might be something in between. There's no inevitability in a developmental psychopathology model that a given risk factor inevitably leads to a given outcome. Why? Because of the transactional models that were in point number three. So Joan, if we could go to the next. Equifinality, you can read through. And next slide, multifinality. I've got to cut some of the text out of these slides one of these days, but these are often used in undergraduate and graduate teaching to try to hammer the points home. And let's go on to the next. Continuity principle number five, and we're nearing the end of this deadly boring, but still important chalk talk is continuity. We would like to understand aggression and antisocial behavior as early as possible. It turns out that extremely difficult temperament is a moderately sensitive predictor of later antisocial behavior, but the behavior in toddlerhood that predicts it is excessive tantruming and fussiness. Well, with homotypic continuity, we would say, boy, that two-year-old who tantrumed the most is the kid who tantrums the most in elementary school and middle school and high school. And of course, that's really not the pattern, is it? Heterotypic continuity assumes that there's predictability and stability, but not of the same essential behavior, but of an old unfolding pattern of a trait-like entity. It may be that the excessively tantrumy, irritable kid is the one in preschool who cusses out his or her teacher, starts to fight and steal in grade school. For a boy is sexually predatory uh, early in middle school more group delinquency in high school, if the kid is still in high school, substance abuse may accompany, and this is all of these are big predictors or partner abuse in the 20s. So the continuity is there, but it's not of tantrums. It's of an unfolding pattern. And I think this is a secret to help unlock this perennial question we have in the field of comorbidity. There are so many darn diagnoses that a kid might have, especially the, the clinically tough ones. I think that a lot of so-called comorbidity is actually heterotypic continuity. A kid progressing from ADHD to DMDD to ODD to conduct disorder to substance use disorder to antisocial personality disorder at 18 may be the same kid undergoing transactional pathways and maybe doesn't really have five or six or seven different diagnoses. Let's go to the next. We'll have to skip inhibited temperament. Sixth principle, risk factors. It's a very atheoretical way we do work in the field. What comes before a difficult clinical outcome and predicts it? A protective factor would operate in the presence of risk to help undo it. So resilience, the way many people define it, is not promotive factors that help everybody, but only in situations of moderate to high risk does some protective influence within the child, within the parent-child dyad or triad, within school, within the community, help to undo that risk. And that process is called resilience. Let's go to the next slide. So these are what protective factors are couple of examples of them at the bottom of the slide. Let's go to the next, please. And then the seventh principle, which is really a repetition of sort of two, three, four, five, and six, you can't understand things reductionistically in developmental psychopathology or any clinical efforts or pediatric efforts. Even genes, well, they're fixed at birth, but Epigenesis predicts when genes get switched on and why something's a skin cell and a brain cell and all kinds of things like that. Even in defining what psychopathology is aggressive behavior adaptive in a high risk environment, maladaptive in an environment that's less maladaptive growing up. And that has a lot to do with this diagnosis and set of dimensions of ADHD. Is it just a function of unresponsive classrooms or is there pathology there? So 
we're going to start the ADHD sort of more practical section of the talk with something called fair use. So I'm going to show you in a second three advertisements for ADHD medications over the last 15 to 20 years. I don't work for pharma. I'm not trying to sell medications. But the doctrine of fair use says that in books I write or articles I uh, put together with my team or talks I give, I can discuss the underlying messages of those advertisements in order to maybe learn something. So let's go to the next slide. So here's an ad almost two decades old for Concerta, the first really effective more than four or five hour ADHD medication from the methylphenidate group. Concerta was uh, designed by a, a small a pharma company down the peninsula before they merged with Johnson & Johnson to find a way through the magic of laser holes and plastic to have a supply of methylphenidate be on the outside of the little cube, give an immediate effect, and then squirt it out gradually over the next 8, 10 to 12 hours. But what about this ad? It's the stereotype from 20 years ago. White middle-class mom, white middle-class son. And the mom says pointedly and poignantly, you know, when, when Jason's medicated, I see my real son, not those annoying, bothersome, stigmatized symptoms. Now, A, is that true? How effective are the medications at seeing the real kid? But if it is true, it's a very powerful message. In fact, in my kind of uh, closet study of advertisements for psychotropic medications, this is the first one in the ADHD world that at least implicitly had an anti-stigma message. If you medicate your kid, you'll remove the stigma. If that's true, it's, it's quite something. And the next slide moves us into the adult world. Kids with ADHD, more kids are medicated every year because more kids percentage-wise get diagnosed every year. But the rate of diagnosed kids who get medicated has stayed relatively constant for the last 20 years. The market for growth in ADHD meds is adults. So here's an ad for Adderall XR, extended release, pertaining to the adult market. And you can read the fine print if you've got really good eyes and see citations to the psychiatric literature. If you've got ADHD as an adult, guess what? You're about twice as likely to be getting or have been divorced, and you're about a third more likely to get depressed. Well, wait a minute. What about transaction? What came first? the marital discord or the ADHD yet to be diagnosed? Is depression comorbid before the ADHD appears? Lots of questions, but you can see the power of the rather simplistic notion that medicating an adult with ADHD will solve a lot of life problems. So here's our final slide next, Joan. Um, whoops, there it is. And this is our friend Shane Victorino, now retired from Major League Baseball, first Hawaiian American to play Major League Ball World Series rings with the Phillies and the Red Sox. And he became part of a campaign, an anti-stigma campaign, about uh, six or seven years ago. And as he says, this slide has so many megs, it cut off the, the title. I didn't outgrow my ADHD. That's why I'm telling my story. So Shane got diagnosed when he was younger played major league ball with a diagnosis of ADHD. He was very open about it uh, and was part of two uh, pharma companies and two self-help advocacy groups putting together this campaign. Now, there's another story. Oh, let's keep to that slide. There's another part of the story behind why he's telling his story. You can't get stimulant medication in major league sports unless you have an ADHD diagnosis confirmed. So it turns out that compared to the NFL uh, and the NHL and the NBA, there's almost twice as many major league baseball players who get ADHD exemptions. Now, this could be a very fascinating epidemiologic finding, or it could be a simpler explanation, which is that Baseball is the most boring sport ever invented in human history. I can't say that on the night the Giants are playing the Dodgers to go on and advance toward the World Series. Um, I'm not a huge baseball fan, but think about it. This is part of the big controversy, isn't it? Maybe people, adults in particular, are gaming the system to get an ADHD diagnosis on the basis of a non-evidence-based brief assessment to be able to take a stimulant to, in the 10th inning, see that hanging curveball or track the ball in the outfield. 
And this is part of the controversy about ADHD these days is, is it a valid diagnosis? And we're finally diagnosing kids, especially girls, especially kids of color um, that never got diagnosed before. Or is this a sort of an American, uh, and in fact, US and Israel have about double the rates of ADHD diagnosis of any other country on earth. Is this a product of a pressure-driven culture and people are in some ways gaming the system to get accommodations and get medications? Controversies everywhere. So now let's move to the next slide. So what is ADHD? It's high developmentally extreme levels of either inattention, disorganization, or hyperactivity, impulsivity, or both. And if it's both, you have the combined presentation, or you could have either single presentation alone. The, the simple hyperactive impulsive presentation is most prevalent in kids who are three, four, or five. By the time they hit first grade, most of them will graduate, if you will, into the combined presentation because now they're in a formal school curriculum uh, and the inattention is much more salient. Uh, you've got to rule out, you've got to do everything else you do to make a DSM diagnosis. Let's go to the next slide. If a kid is carefully diagnosed with ADHD and you follow that kid up over time, we have learned uh, in the last decade of economic research and sociometric research and family research that the cost of the US economy each year for youth, not the direct costs of treating ADHD, but the indirect costs or the offsets, special ed, juvenile justice, substance use treatment is about $100 billion. And of course, we talk about trillion dollars in the headlines today, like it's nothing. $100 billion is pretty substantial. And for adults with ADHD, mainly related to job insecurity, underemployment, workers' comp, it's about double that. Point two, kids with ADHD, on average, are less liked by their peers than kids with autism spectrum disorders or depression or delinquency or anxiety disorders in part because of the impulsivity involved in the, the combined form of ADHD. And I think of this, I've witnessed it with my own eyes uh, when a couple of our boys were younger. These are the kids who often can't wait for the cake to come out at the birthday party and the candle wax is oozing down on the icing and they blow out the candles, except it was their friend's birthday. And I've seen this for both boys and girls. That lack of impulse control is a killer socially. The inattentive form, these are kids who often don't read social cues as well. They're not as actively rejected by their peer group as they are ignored uh, and, and isolated and lonely. What about families? We'll have a little more to say about family dynamics in just, in just a few minutes, but family interactions are not the primary cause of ADHD, which is 75 to 80% heritable. But family interchange has everything to do with comorbidities and either maintaining or deflecting ADHD symptoms uh, in some work we'll talk about just in a few minutes in the talk. Let's go to the next slide. Like everything else in the DSM, I sometimes say to my students at Cal, the only problem I have with DSM is its title the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. If they would just change the title to being the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Syndromes, I'd say fine. Syndrome, correlated signs and symptoms, a disorder, a syndrome with a unifying cause, there's not one condition in the DSM that is a formal disorder. Autism is not, there's no unifying cause, ADHD, depression, PTSD, et cetera, et cetera. There are more boys than girls with ADHD at about two and a half to one, not the 10 or 20 to one I learned was the actual ratio in grad school. This is because we do better representative sampling now. And remember the rule of thumb is all neurodevelopmental disorders in the first 10 years of life, autism spectrum, Tourette's, uh, even cerebral palsy, which is neurodevelopmental to some extent, early onset conduct disorder are two to one, many forms of learning disability, learning disorder are two to one to five or six or seven to one boy to girl, which would be the subject of a whole other talk. ADHD is not just a Western, a United States invention and convention. 
the rates of diagnosis or kids meeting the criteria are unbelievably similar everywhere in the world, about five to 6%, maybe 7% of all kids, two to one boy to girl, except in the US and Israel for many cultural reasons. Let's go to the next. So let's just spend a few minutes on what might be going on inside the brains and minds of kids with ADHD and if developmental psychopathology can help us understand this. Well, of course, it used to be called minimal brain dysfunction or the clumsy child syndrome or the immaturity syndrome, then hyperactivity and hyperkinesis, then ADD with or without hyperactivity, today ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, it's hard to even say it. Well, attention's the first word. But is ADHD an attentional disorder? Well, as any cognitive psychologist will tell you, there are several different forms of attention. Sustained attention, this is what Virginia Douglas up in Canada thought was really the root of ADHD. If I talk long enough, we'll all be asleep after one o'clock, sometime this afternoon sooner than we would be. But people with ADHD be asleep sooner. But many studies in cognitive psych have shown that people with carefully diagnosed ADHD have a difference in performance from about millisecond 500 on. So maybe it's selective attention, knowing how to pick the target of interest rather than distractors. Or maybe it's attentional capacity. How many bits of information can you keep in mind and manipulate, which gets us into working memory. So you can see we're already away from inattention per se into executive function. And if ADHD were totally an attentional deficit, how would you explain hyperfocus, especially for people with the inattentive variant being so locked in that whether it's a video game or a really preferred project, that it's hard to deflect attention hours and hours later. So a broader conception would be number two here. ADHD is not just an attentional deficit, but it's an executive deficit. Cognitive control is the newer term for the kind of old term of executive functions, but how do you plan an activity or day? Can you control interference and remove distractions from your mental world? Working memory, kind of like attentional capacity, error correction. There's an EF set of models of ADHD, but two problems. Number one, about a third to 40% of people with ADHD function perfectly normally on EF tasks if you give them in the lab or the clinic. And there's EF models of PTSD and conduct disorder and autism. It's not specific to any given disorder. Let's move along. Number three, Russ Barkley said 25 years ago, yes, there's important executive function deficits in ADHD, but the fundamental deficit is response inhibition, keeping at bay a previously rewarded prepotent response and deciding what you really want to do, engaging your other executive functions and the blowing out the birthday candles because the stimulus was just so great before you realize it was your friend's birthday would be a classic example. The problem is that the response inhibition or disinhibition is claimed by many, many neuropsychologists to be just yet another executive function. So the debate goes on. Back in the 40s, 50s, 60s, the old minimal brain dysfunction, big ideas about motivational deficits. Not that people aren't motivated with MBD or ADHD or not trying, but there's a fundamental deficit in the inability to develop intrinsic motivation. Yeah, if the task is really something you're good at and onto and into, but for difficult or more rote tasks, maybe a dopamine deficit is predicting um, real difficulty in forming the intrinsic motivation that most kids will develop gradually over time. So these are four models, but here's the last point on this slide. What's the biggest deficit, i.e. on which attentional or executive function task do kids with ADHD show the biggest deficit? It's a trick question. F, all of the above, or G, none of the above. The biggest deficit in ADHD, as several recent meta-analyses have shown, is much higher variability, higher variance 
especially within subject over trials, doing it well and then blowing it and then missing it and then coming back. Regardless of executive function or attentional task, ADHD is marked by consistent inconsistency. So it's a mistake to think of ADHD as an attention deficit versus a deficit in the ability to regulate attention as situational demand shift. Class one in middle school to class two, algebra to English, school to home, peer group one to peer group two. So this gives us an idea that it's not a simple matter of bumping up dopamine or behavior modification. It's gonna require transactional chains, lots of work on home discipline styles, lots of work with teachers on making this a more ad adaptive environment for kids than any simple model of ADHD. So let's go to the next slide. One more kind of neural talk, here's a, uh, uh, a brain and we know the prefrontal cortex and of course cortex from Greek means bark, it's the outer layer. Phil Shaw and his colleagues at NIH, this is a 15 plus year series of studies, did the world's first structural MRI longitudinal study of cortical development. In a big normative sample, they found that the prefrontal cortex reached its maximum thickness in most kids between age six and seven. You're born with way too many neurons, you prune, the cortex develops, maximizes, and then gradual pruning until the late 20s. However, they had a sample of 237 kids with ADHD, uh, about two thirds boys, a third girls, most with the combined form. We don't know how much this pertains to the purely inattentive variant. When did those kids reach their maximal prefrontal cortical thickness? Three years late by age nine and a half to 10. So the old name for ADHD from the 50s, from the factor analytic studies, it was called the immaturity syndrome. These are kids who behave several years younger than their age. There's some evidence that not only in grade school, but also later in adolescence as the prefrontal cortex normatively prunes and thins, adolescents with ADHD are still several years behind. We don't know how much this normalizes by adulthood in longer term follow-up studies. Clinically, this helps me to think about, not to belittle or demean, but to think about this kid struggling at home and struggling with peers and struggling in the classroom with ADHD may actually be neurally behind his or her peers by several years which is a big rationale for some of the behavioral supports and executive function training that is a big part of treatment. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Very quickly, many twin and adoption studies, despite their flaws, there's enough of them done in the ADHD world, either categorically or in terms of the underlying dimensions of inattention and hyperactivity and impulsivity, heritability is not quite as high as bipolar disorder or autism spectrum, which are 0.8 to 0.9, but 0.75, 0 0.8, 0 0.85. The stereotype that ADHD is just a product of lousy schools or lax parenting is, is a misreading. Now there may be more ADHD than ever before for environmental reasons, but individual differences at any time point are largely driven by genes. Well, of course that means right, that the only valid treatments are biological and that psychosocial family school psychotherapeutic work is ineffective. That's a complete misreading of heritability. Despite the individual differences predicted by genes, a trajectory of any given case can be massively altered by environmental input. And we know this from PKU, which has a heritability of 100%, because it's just a double recessive. It's all genetic, if you will, but changing a diet to eliminate phenylalanine uh, can normalize intelligence over time. There's many other risk factors, often prenatal, perinatal, many biological, but let's move to the next slide. When does ADHD come to the fore? Usually in grade school, sometimes in preschool, given the high pressures in many preschools these days. The cause of ADHD, tongue-in-cheek, is compulsory education. Well, it doesn't really cause it, but it reveals it. 
just the way it reveals learning disabilities. I think you could have had ADHD in a hunter-gatherer society uh, tens of thousands of years ago or today and the few remaining ones. Extreme impulsivity might have lost the, the, the tribe's hunt. But when we've made kids do things in the last couple hundred years that no human brain ever evolved to do, sit still for long periods of time and make sense of these funny symbols or pictograms called words, um, now, again, amazingly consistently, about five to six to seven percent of kids, except in subsistence cultures where there's starvation rather than education as the priority, amazingly similar percentages of kids, makes you think that when that threshold is raised by compulsory education, this is the revealer of some underlying biological differences. Let's go to the next slide. What about parenting? So we're gonna go really quickly and all of you know this from earlier classes or lectures or continuing ed across the world and across the last 50 years of research, two fundamental dimensions cross-culturally characterize parenting. There's many more, but the two fundamental ones are on the x-axis, how warm and supportive are you of your kid? Low to high, going left to right. And then on the y-axis, how limit setting, controlling, demanding are you going from low to high? And it turns out then in these normative studies, these are essentially uncorrelated. They correlate about at 0 0.02 or 03, meaning that the four quadrants are almost equal size. If you're a very high warm parent, you're almost depending on you know, across different parents, you could be very low, medium, or high on demandingness and control and vice versa. So the authoritative cluster is often stereotyped in developmental psychology as optimal, this maximum blend of warmth and loving and limit setting and demanding appropriately, permissive, high on warmth, much less demand, authoritarian, top left, less on the warmth, higher on the demands and limit setting. Universally, the quadrant you don't want to be in as a kid is the bottom left, uninvolved, and the adjective on the far bottom left, neglectful. Neglect is still neglected in the maltreatment literature. It's more prevalent than physical or sexual abuse or emotional abuse, devastating in terms of malnutrition, devastating in terms of cognitive stimulation and development, but the question is, is everybody do best in an authoritative home or do some kids do better or worse? Maybe a, a very self-regulated kid, the parents can relax controls. Other kids need a more authoritarian boot camp style. So in some of the earlier work in my career I did with ADHD, we set to test this out. And if you go to the next slide. So back and we got this published in child development, the highfalutin basic developmental science journal that 25 years ago didn't want to publish much on psychopathology. Our initial aim was to find a group of, this was boys at the time, we've done subsequent work with girls, to find a group of kids at a relatively early age and randomly assign them to learn, to, to learn and live in different homes with different parenting styles. Now at UCLA and at Berkeley, the IRB, the Human Subjects Protection Committee, kind of argued with that, as you can understand. So we did the next best thing, which is try to do a naturalistic study. Measuring parenting is a big deal. Most parenting self-report scales are heavily biased by social desirability, but we found one that Berkeley colleagues had been developing called the Ideas About Parenting Scale that has 15 items that really load onto an authoritative factor. Warmth, you can see some of the items here. Clear limits, let your kid know if you're upset with their behavior. You also encourage independence and you reason with kids, not after misbehavior. It's a more democratic style. Our hypothesis was that during summer camps where we'd have boys with ADHD and comparison boys participate, those boys with ADHD who had an authoritative primary caregiver would be more socially competent in terms of peer regard, peer popularity at the end of the camps um, than with those in less authoritative homes. And here's what we found. 
first of all, very low, almost a very large effect size, 0.8 almost. The moms and primary caregivers of boys with ADHD were less authoritative than the moms of the comparison board. It's hard to be authoritative with a kid with ADHD. We found this with girls too. Warm, we argue every day over homework. Limits, I just want him to make sure that he doesn't beat up his sister. I mean, these are the things that you know parents are almost right in the margins of the rating scale. However, there was just as much variance in the group of caregivers of boys with ADHD as in the comparison group. Some parents of kids with ADHD somehow are just as authoritative as many families in the comparison group. So what did we find? Go to the next slide. In the boys with ADHD, the only significant predictor, we observe behavior every day, how overtly aggressive they were, how sneaky they were, how internalizing, sad, and anxious they were. The only significant predictor of social competence for the boys with ADHD was the boy's primary caregiver's authoritative parenting style. Very quickly on the bottom of the last slide, don't go back to it, the beta weight was 0.4. In the comparison group of boys, it didn't matter at all. You didn't need to have an, an especially authoritative primary parent to develop friendships and popularity with your peers because it kind of comes naturally. So there's evidence that authoritative parenting may be particularly protect, pro protective for kids with ADHD in the way that it's not for other kids. Now, I know what you're thinking, wait a minute, there's probably some genes that predict pro-social positive parenting in certain parents and positive pro-social behaviors in kids and in biological families, Kid shares 50% of genes with each parent. So next slide. If you don't believe me, believe my friend Gordon Harold and Gordon Harold and his team over in the UK, series of studies eight years ago and one just published online a couple of months ago. They found the same thing in large British adoptive samples. And of course, when you're in an adoptive family, you don't share common genes with your adoptive parents. So here's the quick picture. In these large thousands adoptee studies, there's about 5% of the kids who meet criteria for ADHD. By the age of five, those kids' ADHD behaviors are predicting less authoritative and more authoritarian, more strict, sometimes harsh parenting. The harsh parenting at age five, even if you factor out the ADHD kids' behavior that in some ways drove that. That parenting style predicts 10 years later, maintenance of ADHD symptoms, addition of aggressive symptoms and academic underachievement in school. In a sample where gene environment correlation is taken out of the picture, because this is an adoptive samples. So despite the high heritability of ADHD, parenting really does matter. It's not all in the genes. So for our last topic, we're going to talk for a few minutes, very few, on ADHD in girls and women. I wrote a grant to the NIMH 27 years ago saying, my team thinks that ADHD really does exist in girls more than the field thinks, and we're going to use our same summer camp model to really study them in an ecologically valid context and learn a ton. We got uh, tons of data from those summer camps, 140 girls with ADHD, and we followed them up systematically. Let's go to the next slide. So keep going because it's a sort of sequence thing. 140 girls with ADHD, 88 match comparisons, keep going because we'll get the bubbles filled in. And because we're relentless and because the families and girls really appreciated the service of this free research summer camp, we've been able to keep track of 92 to 95 percent of them into their mid-20s. We're engaged in our fifth wave of follow-up right now when they're all in their 30s. So I want to talk about a particular topic here. And if we could go to the next slide. We found both at baseline when they were in grade school and in adolescence and in emerging adulthood and in early adulthood, the girls with ADHD were behind their peers in a whole lot of domains. What do you do in a longitudinal study? Well, you keep the same measures you had before. If you want to measure change, don't change the measures. 
is what longitudinal researchers often say. But you have to add measures in over time that will capture the developmental unfolding. So next slide. We added measures in starting in our third wave between the ages of 18 and about 23 of self-harm. Both suicidal actions where the intent was to die and NSSI, non-suicidal self-injury, which if you follow the literature and follow just any kids you're working with, this is getting epidemic more and more over the years, especially in teenage girls where the intent is not to die. The intent is to what? Deflect pain or feel physical pain, to mask the psychological pain or to distract yourself from how bad your life is, but it's hard to talk to anybody about it. And we looked at these two separately, even though the most potent predictor of suicide attempts in 120s is a history of NSSI in one's teens. So don't think that they're completely separate. They correlate about 0.5. So here's what we found initially in uh, a publication. Next slide, please. Uh, from our wave three, average age uh, between 19 and 20, 23% of the girls who came to our programs with the combined type or presentation of ADHD, a lot of impulsivity as well as inattention, had made a serious suicide attempt by that age 8% of our inattentive group and 6% of our comparisons. The 6% matches the national statistics. The Bay Area is not an outlier. In terms of moderate to severe NSSI, not twirling your hair or picking at your cuticles, nothing like that, but um, cutting, burning, other ways of self-mutilating, 51% of the combined type with uh, deep engagement a little over a quarter of the inattentive and 19% of the comparisons. Again, 19, 20, 25%. That's about the typical rate of self-reported NSSI in late teens these days. This is alarming. Since the publication of the study in 2012, international data are pouring in that ADHD is a risk factor, especially in girls and women for self-harm. And what we've been doing over the years is trying to figure out what's going on. So let's go to the next slide. Did you have ADHD or are you a comparison kid at baseline? 10 years later, how severe was your NSSI? What mediated that at our second wave in, in early to mid adolescence? Your poor executive function on a classic EF test, cancel underline, and your parents and teachers report of your acting out aggressive behaviors. Now keep that in mind, let's go to the next slide. What was the mediator same design of suicide attempts yourself and teacher and parent reports of your depression and anxiety and social isolation. So more externalizing adolescent behaviors, preferentially predicting NSSI, internalizing, predicting attempted suicide. Next slide. In another study done in our lab, same model here, commissions, we just used a dimensional score to predict it's basically ADHD. What predicted in the peer domain severity of NSSI was your experience of being physically or relationally victimized by your peer group. And now next slide, keep that in mind. What preferentially predicted suicide attempts was the middle school teacher's report of how rejected you were by your classmates. Next slide. Maya Gundelman's master's thesis, uh, very important finding. She had a team code rigorously the presence, blind to diagnostic status, of physical abuse, sexual abuse, or neglect. Not only was there somewhat more of that statistically significantly in the girls with ADHD and then the comparisons, but if you are a girl with ADHD with a history of one or more forms of such maltreatment, your attempted suicide rate went up from basically 23% or the average of 23 and eight to 34 to 35%. Just as with bipolar disorder, a condition with very high heritability, when a person with bipolar risk or disorder experiences maltreatment, the suicide rate already astronomical in bipolar disorder goes up substantially, and the same is true in ADHD. Can't talk about the last finding. Let's go to the next slide. Another finding by our fourth wave, average age, late 20s, 43% uh, of the girls with ADHD had had one or more unplanned pregnancies compared to 10 to 11% of our uh, match comparison group. 
academic performance and low academic performance in middle school mediated that. I'm gonna take one more minute to talk about all of ADAD's ADHD intervention in two slides. Obviously this would take two days. If your goal is to reduce ADHD symptoms, medication works relatively quickly if you get the right agent and the right dose uh, and it's pretty effective. If your goal is to reduce those symptoms, reduce internalizing and internalizing comorbidities and promote more authoritative parenting, better social skills and better academic performance, lower is better here, more improvement. It took in the MTA study, a big multi-center study 25 years ago, the well-delivered combination of optimal medication and about a year and a half of behavioral treatment, including school and family and peer modules to get not just symptoms, but impairments maximally taken care of. And then last slide, complicated slide, what does all this mean? In that big MTA study, the red line here is teachers' reports in the second year of treatment, at the end of the second year of treatment, as to who's aggressive or disruptive in classroom or not. The red graph, and the only one of the four treatments we assigned to that got into the normal range was medication and behavioral treatment, the combination, if the parenting had changed significantly towards authoritative parenting over the course of treatment. ADHD is heritable, but it's transactional processes at home and school that can make a clinically significant outcome. So I've got an acknowledgement slide. And as our moments are waning, questions, thoughts. Oh, that's right. Scan the QR code. Yes, this is very important for the uh, for attendance. But thank you so much, Dr. Hinshaw. Sure. Uh, one question did come through. Can a child be di can a child who was diagnosed with ADHD actually have good academic performance? Yes, it's rare. ADHD, but kids, people with ADHD are more different than they are similar. It's true of any diagnosis. There are many kids, and especially girls with ADHD. I just completed and sent to my publisher yesterday a book on girls with ADHD that will come out this spring. But one of the points that I really tried to hammer home a bit is, especially girls, socialize to be conforming and, and nurturing, socialize to do well academically. Many girls with ADHD are staying up way too late and compensating and perfectionizing and getting anxious as hell and suffering and struggling. And they're getting A's or A minuses, E pluses barely, but suffering in many ways. And then what happens? Middle school. And then what happens? High school. And then what happens? College, if you go on, or grad school. And we find this age of onset in DSM that you have to have had these symptoms before the age of 12 is missing a substantial number of girls who are doing well academically and are pretty bright and have supportive families who don't start, quote, falling apart academically until the demands really escalate as they get into adolescence and adulthood. Wonderful, one more question. Thoughts about diagnosing ADHD in a child with a known developmental delay? where their inattention and hyperactivity could be developmentally on track with their cognitive skills, yeah. but still very disruptive to their education. Level. Yeah, this, this is a, a really a fascinating question. So as we know, until DSM-5, you could not have an autism spectrum disorder and also have ADHD. Mm -hmm. And then the DSM-5 gurus realize, hey, you know what? Treatments for ADHD may help a lot of kids with autism spectrum, especially higher functioning medications can help, behavioral treatments can help, et cetera, et cetera, even though they don't really cure the underlying social, supposed social motivational deficit. What about intellectual disability or what about other um, forms of physical or cognitive disability for which it's hard to know if it's ADHD or does the other disability really bring along with, alongside it an essential deficit? I think you have to do a thorough assessment, which is the other lesson I didn't have really time to talk about. Why does the US have so many more ADHD cases than other countries? Well, there's a lot of reasons, but one is the average kid in our country gets diagnosed in a 10 to 12 or 15 minute pediatric visit with no rating scales, no developmental history, no rule outs of either comorbid or um, uh, differentially diagnostic conditions. And so 
I don't know how to answer the question specifically, but I would not count out that recognizing and treating the ADHD in some of those developmental disorders might provide some real benefit. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Again, Dr. Henshaw, and thanks to all who came today. Unfortunately, we couldn't get to all the questions, but we'll do our best to try to address some of these later. Um, but uh, looking forward to seeing many of you back here our next month. Take care. Thanks, everybody.